So we've talked about the discrete probability distributions. In particular, we looked at the uh, binomial and the Poisson. These are the only two that we're going to deal with specifically in this course. Um, there are several others, but these kind of give you the give you a flavor of what's going on there. Remember that the key fact that unites all of these discrete probability distributions is that they arise from some kind of counting process. That is, we in the in the case of the binomial, we are counting the number of successes uh, for a given probability and a given um, uh, number of trials. And for the Poisson, we're counting the number of events. So um, in both cases, we have, a, we have a probability mass function that is going to take uh, an integer, that is a positive integer, and map it onto some kind of real number, which is a probability between 0 and 1. So this, these distributions have a function that that outputs a probability given a certain integer count. Um, so there are a couple of things that are different about the continuous probability distributions that are, that are pretty important to remember. So remember that continuous data arises from some kind of measurement. So rather than a count, we have a measurement. And so we have some kind of instrument that gives us a reading of something that um, something that has some kind of continuous value to it. So something like length or volume or mass. So um, these, the, the, the thing about these is that they are no longer constrained to be full, you know, whole numbers. So you know, you can't have 2.25 people, but you can have 2.25861328, um, you know, cubic centimeters of, of volume, for example. So the, the, one of the key issues that we have to deal with then is um, this idea of, uh, of infinite precision. infinite precision. So theoretically, these can go on forever. Now, in, in, you know, practically speaking, at some point, we just have to chop these numbers off and say that we don't really care about anything beyond that. But theoretically, you can get any amount of precision according to, you know, uh, what, whatever your needs are. So since we're dealing with this infinite precision, this creates some problems. And um, I'll give you an example. So here we have a, a machine that fills milk bottles. And let's say these milk bottles, these are 20 ounce bottles, 20 ounce bottles. So as a matter of quality control and for calibrating this machinery here, we take measurements, you know, we, we take samples and take measurements to see how close they are to, to 20 ounces. And so, uh, you know, given this, you know, given this setup, so we might be looking at, um, what if I were to ask you, what do you think the probability of, of um, so we'll define the random variable X as the, um, you know, the ounces of milk. Okay, you see, so um, because we can have partial values here, these, you know, this is not a counting thing. Okay, so we'll say, what if I were to ask you, what's the probability that the number of ounces in a certain milk container is uh, 20 point zero 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 one. Okay. Now you could say, well, that's that particular value. The that's got to be zero or or close to zero. That that's that's insane to ask about that value because you know 
the probability that there's going to be exactly that value is next to nothing. However, this is not theoretically any different from asking what's the probability of there being um, of exactly 20 ounces. Okay, so the, these these should be the same. I'm not sure if they are, but we just have we end in a one here and, and we end in a zero here. But we can see that whether we're asking about 20 ounces or some kind of really, really tiny, larger amount, that the probability of, of, of such um, precise little razor thin values or, or infinitely thin values is next to zero. So remember that with a, with, a, with a discrete probability distribution, we were able to ask this question. Okay, so give me the probability that x is going to be equal to this. And in the case of the the binomial, we had n and pi, and then in the case of the, in the case of the Poisson, we were just given lambda, the rate. Okay, but now in this case, we can't ask about individual values anymore. We can only ask for, and I'll explain why this is a this is an f in a minute. Um, we can only ask for values that are in a certain range. So a less than or equal to the random variable less than or equal to b, um, you know, given some kind of parameters depending on the distribution. Um, we're going to be dealing with the normal distribution here, so let's just say the parameters of the normal distribution are the mean and the variance. Okay. So uh, that's that's the key issue that we have here is we're, we have to figure out probabilities between values. It doesn't make any sense to ask about one particular value. Okay. So let's take a look at what we have then. So remember that, so in the case of the discretes, the, the discrete probability distribution, we had this probability mass function where we had down here our integer values, and then up here, we just, off of the y-axis here, we just read the probability. So for example, in this case, this is a binomial distribution um, with an expected value of 6, and the probability of 6 is equal to, apparently, 0.25. Okay, so this is what a probability mass function. It's very easy to use because you can just read probabilities off the y-axis. Um, but we have something a little bit more complicated with continuous probability distributions. We have something called a probability density function, or PDF. Now, now don't confuse this with the PDF that is mentioned in your calculator. So, for example, it had a had a like a binomial PDF. In that case, that was using this abbreviation to just stand for probability distribution function. Now this is a probability density function. The density is the key term here because the density is what you can only have if you have a continuous random variable. And so um, in, in the case of a probability density function, it works very differently. First of all, we don't have these bars anymore. We can't look at one particular value on the x-axis and then just come up here to a value on the y-axis. It's not that simple. So because we have an infinite range of values along the x-axis, remember because it's it's a continuous random variable, so we have to look at a range. So we, we're going to have, first of all, we're going to have this smooth curve. It doesn't have to be necessarily shaped exactly like this, but it's going to be some smooth curve uh, with, with no spaces in between it, two values, and um, no gaps, I should say, uh, versus just these you know, single bars here. So we got a smooth curve, and we, we're going to, in order to find a probability, we have to look at two points, and then we have to take the area under this probability density function 
And the way you take an area, if you recall from calculus, is you integrate. So we're going to be integrating from A to B of whatever whatever function happens to whatever function happens to make this curve here. Okay. So um, what's what's here on the y-axis then? What what is this? So let's say if we let's say we had like a point four here. Um, what does that point four mean? Um, and the answer is it doesn't really mean anything. All it means is the height of the density function. In order to actually get a probability out of this, we have to do this. We have to take the area under the density function from A to B. And the way you do that is with calculus. Now, uh, the uh, there's some some functions are easy to integrate in calculus. So um, even with my limited memory of calculus, um, I can I can integrate you know a polynomial function quite easy. Uh, that's that's not hard. Um, so if you have a function like this, then it's then it's easy to integrate, and you can just you know find the antiderivative and then evaluate it at the two different endpoints, and then you're done. Um, however, the um, for the for the probability distribution that we're going to look at first, our first continuous probability distribution is the normal. And I want to show you this is the this is the PDF, so the probability density function for the normal for the normal distribution. Okay. And you know what a normal distribution looks like. You have um, an awful lot of measurements, such as the milk one, let's say. Uh, let's say in the case of the milk, uh, if, you know, if the number of ounces printed on the bottle was 20 ounces, then most of our readings are going to be around 20 ounces. And the further you get, from 20 ounces, the less likely you're going to see a bottle with that amount of milk in it. Okay, so this, you know, this and many many other measurement processes have a curve that looks like this. Um, and so this is this is just a normal distribution where its key, you know, its key characteristics is that it's that it's bell shaped. Okay. And this arises from the fact that it's got this, you know, most of the most of the values are going to be pretty close to the mean. Okay. And the further you get from the mean, the less likely you're going to observe those values. Okay. So the other fundamental characteristic of a normal distribution is that it's symmetrical. Okay. So in this case, we're just as likely to be to have too little bit too little milk as to have too much milk. Okay, and then finally, the the third characteristic uh, has something to do with the shape. A little bit more, a little bit more restrictions on the shape is something called the empirical rule, which describes a relationship between the standard deviation um, uh, and the uh, and the distribution. So let's take a look at what we mean by the empirical rule. So the empirical rule, um, and remember that the word empirical just means that it's that it's observed. Um, uh, this is just wisdom gathered over lots of observations. But um, for normally distributed data, you know, when we when we take these measurements, uh, what we we tend to have this curve such that we have sixty-eight percent of our observations within one standard deviation okay so uh, you know this this is kind of this is kind of visible uh, just intuitively here because you can see that most of this probability here is you know between these two points on this curve and then the further out you go the smaller it gets okay so the empirical rule tells us that you should have 68 percent of your uh, your measurements between uh, minus one standard deviation and plus one standard deviation. Okay, um, if you go out two standard deviations, you know you're 
you're going to have a 95%. And then three standard deviations, you're going to have 99.7%. Okay. So this is what the empirical rule tells us. Um, and and uh, uh, normal distributions tend to follow the empirical rule. Um, I'm going to show you a graph. Uh, so there's not actually one normal distribution. There are actually an infinite number. So um, the, the normal distribution is parameterized by two, two parameters. Okay. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, remember that, remember that the, that the binomial distribution had a shape that, that was influenced by N and P, pi. Remember that? So, you know, what the distribution looked like was determined by the total number of trials and the probability of success in each trial. And remember that with the Poisson distribution, its shape was determined by one parameter, that is the lambda, or the rate, or the mean rate. Okay, so we actually have an infinite number of normal distributions because the two parameters for the normal distribution are oops. so for the normal distribution its shape is parameterized by a mean that is where it's centered uh, why don't we just call it center let's just call it center so where is it centered and then finally, it's um, you know standard deviation or variance. They're the same, basically. Okay, so so the normal distribution is going to be determined by these two, and because we can have any number of centers and any number of variances, we can have any number of normal distributions. So, for example, let's take a look. Um, I've got a I'm plotting normal distribution here in Mathematica. Um, and you can see that uh, these two parameters here are the normal distribution parameters. So this one is the center, and this one is the standard deviation. So, for example, you see that it's centered on zero now, but I can move it so that it's centered on one, or I can move it over to the left. I can make it, I can make it centered on negative two if I want to and you know push it over there so so the the normal distribution can be centered anywhere and so in the example that I gave the normal distribution was centered on 20 ounces okay um, the other parameter and I'm going to go ahead and move it back over to to zero the other parameter is the standard deviation so this determines how how spread out it is how wide these tails are so if I were to say, okay, with a standard deviation of two, you can see that two things happen. First, this high point got lower and these tails got fatter, okay? I can bump it up even more, okay? And um, let's try, okay, so if I can make this really small, okay, so now it's so tall you can't even see the top anymore, okay? All right, so um, so the idea is that there are an infinite number of normal distributions. They can because you can have an infinite number of centers and an infinite standard deviation, but they all have those same properties of bell shape, symmetrical, and um, they follow the empirical rule. So um, in our case, most of the time we'll be interested in the standard normal, and we'll say more about that when we get into z scores and evaluating normality um, in the next video. But for now. Um, just know that the normal, the standard normal distribution is one that's centered on zero and has a standard deviation of one. Okay. All right. So, so much like the other, you know, the, the, um, the other probability distributions that we saw, one of the, one of the real, you know, beautiful and convenient aspects of having a probability distribution was it gave us a, a way to calculate probabilities. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how it is we go about calculating probabilities under a normal distribution. Okay, so remember that, as I said, you can't, 
you can't actually um, you can't actually just put in a value and then calculate a single value. You have to come up with this area under this curve. And um, as I said, that would involve having to integrate this function. Okay, so if we're interested in you know finding this area, so this mean right here is actually 20, and this, well, we can just say it's one. We still have to, you know, if we're interested in the area between 19 and 21, we have to integrate between 19 and 21 this function that even after we even after we plug in our parameters is still going to be difficult to to um, integrate so we don't bother with that we just go ahead and use the software tools that we have to to calculate those and i'm going to show you exactly how to do that so okay so just be aware that what we're doing is we are integrating we're basically integrating we're going to be integrating from negative infinity up to this this z score here, this value, we'll just call it x. We're going to be integrating from negative infinity up to that value, and that's going to give us this area here. Okay. So in the default case, so if we are trying to find the probability on a distribution that is centered on 18, okay, with a standard deviation of 5, then what if we're interested in finding the probability that x is less than or equal to 18.6, then we're dealing with a so-called left tail probability. Okay, so we need to find this area here from negative infinity up to x, and it's going to be that you know that that function that we had before. Okay, but we're not going to we're not going to actually do it that way. We're going to use our calculators in Excel to do the, the calculation for us. Okay, so, um, so this question would be, what is the probability of a value less than 18.6 on a normal distribution with a mean of 18 and a standard deviation of 5? Okay, so let's take a look at how we do this. So remember that uh, with the other distributions, we had um, CDFs. Now, these continuous, these continuous probability distributions will always be using the CDF. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll go to, okay, so now we go to our normal CDF, okay? And notice that um, by default, can I clear these values? By default, uh, it, it gives you a negative, you know, negative one, uh, times e to the 99th, okay? And what that is is um, basically negative 10 to the 99th power, which is, um, so 10 to the 99th power is approximately equal to the number of atoms uh, in the known universe. So it's a very large number. So it's essentially infinity. So we're going to be, and because we're multiplying by negative 1, we're going to be integrating from negative infinity all the way up to 18.6. Okay, so um, let's do this. So uh, we're integrating up to 18.6. Okay, now this is where we put in the parameters of the normal distribution that we have. So in this case, 18 and 5. Okay. Okay, so that is going to be equal to 0.548. Okay, so that's a that's a left tail probability. So that's fairly easy. You're just going from negative infinity up to the value, and you can put in your parameters for your distribution. Okay, now what if we have another situation where we're not interested in the left tail, but we want a right tail? So we want to know the probability that x is greater than or equal to some value. Well, in this case, we're just going to do our trick because we know if we take this whole area under this density, it's going to equal one because these are, you know, this as a density, um, it should include every possible uh, 
every possible event, so every possible value, so all of the, the probabilities all need to add up to one. So if these, you know, if we want to get this tail, we just do the entire area minus whatever's down here. Okay. So okay, let's say that this is this is 18.6 again. So we want to know the probability that x is greater than or equal to 18.6. Okay. So what we're going to do is 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 18.6. Okay. And so uh, we already uh, calculated that. Um, we already calculated this part of it. So it would just be, you know, 1, 1 minus 0.548 or, you know, 0.452. Okay. Okay. So this is the so called right tail probabilities, right tail. Okay, so that there's so case one is left tail, case two is right tail. Now, case three is the interesting one. Um, let's say we wanted to find out the the probability that it's between seventeen point four and eighteen, and we'll assume that we have the same distributional parameters as up here. Now, how do we do this? Well, you think about this: if we take the left tail probabilities going all the way up to 18, okay? Then we subtract out the left tail probabilities all the way up to 17.4. Then what we're left with is this little area in here. So in order to get the probability between two different values here, we have to subtract the probability, the left tail probability, the larger one, minus the left tail probability of the smaller one, okay? So um, in this case, let's see. Um, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and calculate this. So we're going to take the probability that x is less than or equal to, and because these are open intervals, we're not going to sweat whether it's less than or less than or equal to. Um, so the probability that x is less than or equal to 18.0 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 17.4, okay? So um, let's go ahead and find this. These are both just left tail probabilities, okay? So we can just pop them into the calculator. Let's do that. <clears throat> okay, we'll do our normal CDF again. Okay, we're going from negative infinity up to 18. with a mean of 18 and standard deviation. Okay, so um, I have a guess what this is gonna be because 18 is the mean, it's gonna be very close to 0.5, so let's see. Okay, so let's just round that to 0.5. So 0 0.5 minus, okay, so the left tail probability here, we'll do the same thing normal CDF, negative infinity. This time we only go up to 17.4. And we keep these the same, the same distribution. And this is 0.4522. Okay, so after you do that subtraction there, you wind up with this area and thus that probability that the random variable falls between those two values, okay? Now, the other way to do these, so I, I showed you how to do them on your calculator, but um, you'll also need to uh, also need to do these in Excel. So let's go ahead and uh, zoom in a little bit here to see a little better, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so how would we do this same thing? Let's say, let's just do this first left tail probability. So um, as you can probably guess, we use the normal CDF in 
you know, on the TI-84. Well, in Excel, um, it's going to have, you know, similar to the, the binomial distribution and the Poisson distribution, it's going to have a norm.dist, okay? And then it just prompts you there for the, for the parameters there. So the value that we're asking about is 18.6, okay? And we said that the distribution is centered on 18 with a standard deviation of 5. And cumulative is going to be true. Okay, So that, again, makes it so that it's the CDF. Okay, So the norm dist with true is the same as the normal CDF on the calculators. Okay, And hopefully we wind up with the same number. Okay, Yeah, it is. All right, so that's how you do that in Excel. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at a problem from the homework and look at how to calculate these probabilities. Okay, so given a standardized normal distribution, so notice that you know of the infinite number of normal distributions you can have, the standard or standardized normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay, so with that you know, with that particular normal distribution, determine the following probabilities. Okay, so we see that we've got um, probability that z is greater than 1.05. Okay, so we've got this standard normal centered on zero, and we've got, it should be a zero, and we want to know 1.05, and we want to know this area over here. Okay, so we're basically going to be, you know, integrating the function from 105 up to positive infinity. Okay, so it's a it's a right tail probability, um, or we can just do, you know, one minus all this, and this is going to be integrating from negative infinity up to 1.05 of the of the density okay all right so let's do that um, uh, let's do it let's do this one on the calculator and we'll do the next one on Excel okay all right so we'll do um, uh, 1 minus okay normal CDF, okay, and this is going to be from uh, negative infinity, okay, so that's good, up to, uh, was it 1.05, 1.05, okay, and because it's a standard normal, it's going to be 0 and 1, okay, Okay, so the probability of it being up there is uh, 0.1469. Okay. Okay, so the next one is asking us the probability that z is less than negative 0.23. Okay, so let's let's draw a quick sketch again. So we've got this. We're centered on zero here. This is negative 0.23. So you know, negative, but only by a little bit. Okay, so we're looking for like all this area here. Okay. All right, so um, let's do that one in Excel. So we'll do the, it's a it's a just left tail probability. So we'll just um, uh, we'll just go from negative infinity up to negative 0.23. So that's just going to be norm dist. Okay, so uh, the value it's asking about so negative 0.23 mean zero standard deviation one cumulative true. Okay, so this um, by default, the way this gives you from negative infinity up to this particular x. Okay, so it should be 0 0.409. Okay, 
Okay. And, um, okay, so C then wants us to find the probability that it falls between two uh, values. So in this case, this is this, um, this case C where we've got our, got our distribution and we've got two values out here from negative 1.96 up to, you know, this one is negative 0.23. And now we're trying to find this area in here, okay? So as I said, what we need to do is take the, the probability of the larger one, so that is this total area here to the left, and then subtract out the area to the left of the 1.96, okay? So this is going to be probability that x, and, and they use z here, it's the same thing probability that x is going to be less than or equal to um, negative 0.23, oh, sorry, negative 0.23, eh, fix this, negative 0.23, and then we're going to subtract out the probability that x is less than negative 1.96, okay? And um, let's go ahead and do this in in one go here. We'll just do the, the whole the whole subtraction in Excel. So we'll go so negative 0.23. So we're going to do um, norm dist negative 0.23, and then once again standard normal, and we're just going to subtract norm dist of the other one, which was negative 1.96, 0, 1, and true. Okay, so we're just doing that subtraction there. Okay, so 0 0.3841, uh, depending on point, how precise we want to be. So this is going to be equal to 0 0.3841. Okay, so the probability is like 40% that it's going to be between those two, two values, okay? All right, so that's A, B, and C. Now, what about D? D is a little bit different, and this is going to get us into um, a new Excel function and also a new value on a new function on your calculator, same thing. What is the value of Z if only 27.43% of all possible Z values are larger, okay? Uh, let, me, let me do some erasing here to give myself a little bit of room to think here. Okay, just get rid of these. <clears throat> okay, so we've got we've got a new kind of question that's actually asking us to go in reverse here. So we've got before we are given z values and asked to come up with probabilities, now we're given basically a probability and asked to come up with a z value. So the idea is that, um, so somewhere along here, we've got a z, let's say it's, um, I don't know, maybe here. So we've got some z such that uh, 27.43% or, you know, the probability is point, total probability under here is 0 0.2743, which means that, you know, if this, if this is all adding up to one, then this area here in the red is going to be one minus this, right? So, so that means this area over here must be um, 0.7, two, five, seven, okay? So um, what we want to do then is we need to find this Z that has you know, 0.7257 um, as a probability, as a left tail probability, okay? So now um, 
we've been able to go the other way. That is, okay, if I have a z, I can get the probability. But now what do we do to go from the probability to get the z? Okay, well, as you can imagine, it's going to be an inverse function. So um, if we come back to Excel, um, you may have noticed this already, but if you type in norm, you see that you got the norm dist, the, which we've been using, but you've also got this norm inv, which is the inverse function. So now see that the pop-up there says returns the inverse of the normal cumulative distribution for the specified mean standard deviation. Okay, well, so um, let's just go ahead and do the open paren, and now we have a probability, which was um, 0.7257. Okay, and um, we're going to use a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. Okay, so norm inverse. So now this is saying, give me the z value corresponding to a left tail probability of 0.7257. And it turns out that it is 0.59989. Or I think, um, I think your homework is asking you to round to two decimal places. So this winds up just being 0.60. Okay, so it's norm inv. Okay, so that um, D, so D is 0 0.60. Okay, okay, so remember that, um, let me do a little cheat sheet down here. So remember that with the norm, with the norm dist, You're putting in a z and getting a probability, but with a with the norm inv, you are putting in a probability and getting back the z value that corresponds to that probability. Okay, so these uh, this particular um, this particular distribution and finding these probabilities, um, this is really going to be significant when we look later at hypothesis testing. Okay. All right. Hope that helps.